Peter. Um, on occasion, usually if there's a baptism, uh, I'll visit this passage. Uh, one thing that I do to keep it from just being a, a redundant a repeat is I, I change it up a little bit. Some of it you'll be familiar with, some of it you will not. With, with everything that's going on, and maybe this was one of the reasons I went the direction today, because I'm still going to talk about baptism. I think Peter does an awesome job, even though uh, for years I read that and it appeared he was saying that, that water baptism is, is part of salvation. But uh, he, he, he does everything but say that. That's just not true. But I, I can understand why some people might think that. But the thing about Peter's writing is he speaks a lot about suffering. It is, I mean, the, the people are going through a terrible time, and Peter is trying to encourage them and in the book of Peter, in this epistle, he covers two categories of truth. One truth, the privilege of the blessings of the Lord in a positive way that, that all of these things are given. But also the privilege, the, the, the second category is the privilege of, of that, that's interwoven in with the first one of the privilege of suffering. And one thing that the American and Christians have not had to endure much of at all is suffering. I implore you to do what you can today to alleviate some of the suffering that no doubt is coming. And, and the reason I say that is for the past couple of weeks, uh, the message from, from the media and uh, the government departments have been preparing for mass casualties. Now, that is kind of uh, strange for our government. That's, that's not in the norm. That's abnormal. But many times, if you'll listen close enough, they'll, they'll tell you what's coming. Now, and it's because of this, they're talking about mass casualties. So, uh, citing from the NFL's own website, uh, as of today, they're speaking to five major cities with huge uh, football stadiums. Uh, when I say they, I'm talking about FEMA. And, and FEMA is, and the NFL is also encouraging other cities to do the same to, in case of a mass casualty, to allow their stadiums to be used. Now, folks, they're, they're telling you something, and we, we might ought to be paying attention, but they're not finished with that. Our, our Congress... I don't personally think that they will pass this, but they are a few of our congressmen that are wanting to amend our Constitution and add an amendment about mass casualties for the continuity of government. Uh, our, our Constitution allows the, the Senate to be replaced, if, if you know our Constitution, but the House of Representatives has to go a little different route. But it's, it's not that they're calling to do it that's got me concerned, but they're saying that we need to do this because we need to make sure that we have a continuity of government in case of a mass casualty or if a shooter was to walk in to, to our, into the Capitol and take out a hundred or so of our legislators. So, so guys, 
you, you can just continue on the path without thinking about what's going on uh, and, and, or you can make sure to do diligence. And part of that is doing what you can to be prepared for anything that comes. Now, in a moment, I'm going to read the passage in 1 Peter chapter 3, and it talks about suffering also. But since Peter seems to be an expert on this, I wanted to get into the head of Peter just a little bit more. And actually, if, I, if this were a class and I was teaching this class and we were going to be meeting every week for me to teach a, a, a subject like how to study the Bible or something in that neighborhood, one of the first things that I would tell you to do is to learn who the author is and find out what you can about the book that you're studying. And this is, this is really going to tie in, so don't, don't allow me to lose you. Don't, don't get lost in this. So when we look at the, the, the first epistle of Peter, and we look at when it was written, because of, uh, of one of the events of, of the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, we know it was prior to that, and history bears out that this epistle was written somewhere in the neighborhood of A.D. 64 or 65. That would have been about 30, 32, 33 years after Christ had went to the cross. Now, if you look up in history, what event happened in that time frame, in that area, you'll be, the, one of the first things that I'm sure you're going to come across was the burning of Rome. And if I'm not mistaken, probably about either 12 or 14 districts, all the districts but maybe two, burn. And history has placed the guilty party as Nero, the emperor. And apparently he wanted to rebuild or he wanted to build some things in Rome. And in order to do that, the thing that he felt he needed to do was to destroy what was there so he could rebuild back what he wanted. Now pay attention. Well, so history tells us in A.D., July the 18th, A.D. 64, Rome burned. It burned for six days. Because of the destruction and the folks that, it's the mass casualties and the fatalities, the people started getting upset. And they were beginning to write So he needed a scapegoat. And do you know who the scapegoat was? Christians. Now, the reason the Christians were the scapegoats was because they were already in opposition, maybe defiance is too hard of a word, but opposition to the Roman culture. So let's come forward a little bit. Now today, not saying that, that you are, but generally speaking, Christian people will vote for Donald Trump. That's generally speaking. Donald Trump on the left is accused of being a a person that is going to destroy our way of life in America, our culture, our government, whatever the case may be. Even Hillary Clinton has come out and said these people that support Donald Trump, and I don't remember her exact words, but it's something like they'll need to be dealt with. 
So I'm telling you, a stage, we, we see what happened. I, I, the similarities for me, and, and I'm not trying to make a connection, but I see similarities here. And I see the similarities there that because we have been a supporter of Donald Trump, a lot of the Christians, that the Christians will also be the person that they will come after. Now, we've not seen this type of persecution probably ever in America, but no doubt it is coming. And we know that time, I, I really think everything's falling in line with, with the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, and, and coming to the UN a few days ago. Uh, most of the people just got up and walked out. We, we know from the Scripture that the, the nations of the world is basically going to turn against Israel. We see this happening, uh, especially, apparently, this bomb that they dropped in Lebanon to take out the, the leader of, of Hezbollah was a lot stronger. I, I'm telling you guys, I think I've seen that bomb on, on film. I thought it was a tactical nuclear bomb. I seen the shock wave, and then and then you seen the explosion, and then you heard the blast. It was something like I'd never seen before. But they're saying there is a lot more casualties there. And if you see the people that are leaving Lebanon, it is unreal. But we see nation after nation is beginning to turn against Israel. We, we hear the talk of mass casualties. So we, we have to believe, uh, especially when Jesus tells us the world hates me, they're going to hate you. Peter is telling his folks, why do you think it's something strange that you're going through these sufferings? We, we see this coming, so we need to put ourselves and get ourselves in a position uh, that, that we see Peter here in getting the folks ready. Now, I don't know what's going on with Peter. If you, if you go through and look at the contents of, of what he's writing, I mean, Peter, Peter will write about, he, he's a very practical writer. Uh, and he's given answers to, to these practical questions about Christians living in, in such a time as, as questions like, do we need do we need someone like uh, a priest to go to to intercede for us with God? He 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 answer, He has that to say. Uh, what should the Christian's attitude to secular government, even if they're civil disobedient? Peter is given some instructions for that. Peter Peter also gives instruction on an employee that is working for a evil employer. And then he's also giving some instructions on how a wife can win her unbelieving husband to the Lord. But in the middle of all this, it seems kind of strange, other than the suffering part that goes with it, he talks about baptism. I don't know if he's reaffirming the Christians there because of what they're going through because he, he, he's not getting down in the, in the gutter with them. He's telling them, listen, you belong to the Most High God and you need to act like that. You, you need to walk like that. And, and uh, so, so he's encouraging these people. So that's what we're going to do now. One little thing I, I do want to bring up, because I just love this kind of stuff. In chapter 5, and then we're going to get to the, the, the passage. In chapter 5, he gives the area of where he's at when writing this letter. And he says, Babylon. But he's not in Babylon. Don't know if he's ever been to Babylon. 
There's a Babylon that's a little closer. Has a city now by the name of Babylon? Absolutely never been there. Here is the one that I, that, that, that I really like. And, and, it, and it's because it really speaks to today. Especially during COVID. If you were on YouTube, and we've had things took down here because I've mentioned COVID-19 in a negative way or the vaccine, they shut you down. They're not so bad anymore. There's, there's one YouTube channel, and his name is Marfugel. And he, he, he gives himself that name because it's, it's a code name. And, and when, when this was at its height, any time that you, you called in, you had to speak in code. They also was doing this during this time. Because of the, the persecution going on in the Christian church, Peter did not want this letter to fall in the hands of the Roman officials thinking that this was a letter being written to the Roman church there. So he used the word Babylon even when he, and it was a code word for Rome. I, I've been reading, that's the first time I've read that this week in some of the, the, uh, the historians. I liked it because today we have to, we have to speak code or you have things taken down even still today. So with that thought in mind, we're going to go to chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, so, so you got a little bit more this time than you got the last time. So that means I'm going to have to leave a little bit of something out to be able to get my time in uh, at a decent hour, because we, we do have a baptism, and um, I probably don't have the, 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 the breath anyway to go much longer than I normally go. So, so here we go, chapter 3, verse 18 is where we're going to start, and I'm reading from the English Standard. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So let's stop right there. We've got to deal with this passage. Tim, Paul tells us in Timothy's writing that if we should be a good workman, rightly dividing the Word of God. Because for many years I read this passage and I interpreted all of it wrong. Until I learned to start rightly dividing the Word of God. So you may be reading over and you're thinking, well, I don't see anything wrong there. Well, if you're a Bible student, there's, there's a chance you may have misinterpreted this passage. And then this one, he says, alive... Actually, let's go back there and see again. He said, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteousness for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. This is not talking about the Holy Spirit. This is talking about His Spirit. And it's, okay, we've got to keep going to make it in context. In which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. All right, so we have to deal with this. Then we'll get, into, we'll get into the baptism part. That he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Now, they are some, especially the word of faith. And, and actually, uh, l let me say this. The Apostles' Creed is in our bylaws. But everything from my understanding of the Apostles' Creed, when it says that Jesus went into hell, it's not talking about torment. You know, when, when uh, and, and what I mean, when the thief was on the cross, what Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. 
So we see that even the Old Testament saints, many of the Old Testament who had went to paradise, we see Jesus and we get this from the, the account with, with Abraham and Lazarus and the rich man and the conversation they're having. And, and, and the rich man wanting Abraham to send back Lazarus to let his uh, brothers know not to come here. So we see even David in the Old Testament says, Lord, don't leave my soul here in Sheol or hell. So we know that the Lord went into the ground and he went into the ground for the purpose of setting those that were captive free, not those that were in torment or those that were in the, in the torment part of hell. It's not talking about those, but he went and set those captives free. And, and Matthew tells us that when Jesus resurrected, these also resurrected with him and were witnessed by the people there in the community. So that, that's pretty cut and dry as far as I'm concerned. But when we get to this passage, it is talking about the torment side in spirit, not flesh, that Christ went. But when he says he went and preached to the spirits, it's not men. When you look at the Greek word here for spirits, as, as far as I know, it is never used for a man. It's only used for spirits. So where are these spirits? And, and all he was doing, so let me get this out, all he was doing, because he wasn't going to set anyone free. He wasn't going to, to preach the, the plan of redemption for someone to accept it and, and to be turned loose. No, when you're in this place, you're there for eternity. But who are these these spirits, these demon spirits that Christ is proclaiming that what I said I would do, the redemption for mankind, I have just now done that. He made this proclamation to those who were there. And where did they come from? Well, the next verse tells us, so let's go on. Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. So this is where they are from. And this is also a warning. Because these demons, they pushed beyond God's patience. They were, they were doing such evil deeds that it was so deceiving and so infectious that Noah preached for 120 years and no one listened. And the Lord took these demons. His patience had run out. The evil had went beyond his patience. And now he's had enough. And he has bound them in the abyss. These are the demons that the Lord Jesus is making a proclamation to that the very thing that I said I would do, I have done. Not a redemption for them, not a release for them, just a proclamation. That's all it is. Don't read any more into it than that. And definitely do not read into this, this is people. It is not. If anyone is taking you through the Greek, or if they're telling you, and, and, and then you need to go to the Greek, but if they're taking you through the Greek and calling this people, then they are badly misrepresenting the Greek, in my opinion. And I'm going to tell you something, guys. I don't look at just one Greek. Several different... I, I have a library like most people would kill for. Honestly, I do. And I have spent... Thousands upon thousands and upon thousands of dollars for the library that I have. When you've been deceived like I have, you're, you're, you're going to do whatever you have to do. You go on vacation, spend $3,000. I go online and buy $3,000 worth of material. The thing about it, the Lord's made it. 
I remember calling this company up, and they said, what, what do you want today? I said, I want everything you got. I said, but you're going to have to give me a real deal. I bought everything that company had for $1,600. It's about $100,000 worth of material. And I've done that three or four times. I bought one one day, paid $2,500 for it, and it was about $150,000 worth of material. God has been really good to me to, to give me this kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm telling you, that doesn't mean that I'm getting everything right. But boy, there's a whole lot of people wrong at this or men. It's, it's not. It's not because when the flow of context tells you that it was these demons that were... And it tells you when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So here we go. Baptism. Verse 21, which cor corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and now sits at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to Him. Now, we don't need to talk about the suffering anymore. Let's just see if we can just focus on baptism because I'm going to tell you, you can, be, you, you can be excused if you believe this is saying baptism is part of salvation because it surely sounds like it does. This is exactly what it sounds like until you start reading con it in context and rightly dividing this word, you will find out just as much as maybe you believed that Peter was saying baptism was part of salvation, now you will believe 180 that that he does an outstanding job letting you, uh, helping us to understand that water baptism has nothing to do with salvation. And, and if you're here, I'd be more than happy, not today, but I'd be more than happy to sit down with you and we'll walk a path through the Scripture, but we will use Scripture and actually, we ought to be thankful that, that, that baptism is not something that there's no works at all. Baptism is, is not the event. It's the picture of the event. Something that's already happened. So let's, let's break it down a little bit. And some of this now you, you might be familiar with. And we ask the question, who saved Noah? Who was it? Or what was it that saved Noah? Well, we look to the book of Hebrews to help us out a little bit. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, it says that by faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So what saved Noah? Faith. 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 Remember that. That's what saved all the Old Testament saints. It is the ark that lifts above these raging waters. The waters come upon the land, but it's only those that are inside the ark that are saved. The waters destroy. So it's not the water that saves, it's the water that destroys. It's a picture of destruction. We, and you'll hear me say that three or four different times probably. So, so the baptismal waters don't represent something that will save us. They represent death. Because death, sin, always brings death. Always. Remember that. So if I could take just one moment to give you some, some advice here. And quit playing around with sin. When, when the cell phones and text messaging started, the text messaging for sure, when it, it really started to gain a lot of ground, and by the way, I love text messaging. I, that is my go-to. It's not email. It's not on the phone talking. Text. Man, I can, I can fly through these texts. Now, sometimes you might get a message that don't make any sense because I've been flying through it. And... 
But when these text messages come out, it brought some problems in the family. And I had to convince these men that were texting these women that they were being unfaithful to their wife. And of course, the men that didn't believe me, they wind up getting divorced. Because for women are such emotional beings, and, and I try to explain the guys this way, that that emotional connection that you're making with that woman that you're texting is the same feeling that you would have if she's actually having a physical relationship with another man. But I couldn't get, couldn't get the men a lot to believe it to begin with, and then they realized, yeah, there's something to this. There's a great problem. So the reason I bring it up is because round two is here. AI. AI porn. I'm telling you, I'm already reading articles, it's destroying people. Your kids got your phone? Listen, I love playing golf on my phone. I, 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 love, I, I used to play golf all the time, and I, threw, I, I, I messed up both rotators, and, and I wound up quitting. But I, but I love playing it on, on my phone. I'm telling you, every other text is an AI girl, or not text, but every other commercial, unless you pay for no commercials. Every other commercial comes out is a woman. They will have her right there, and, and they might have whatever game, if they're promoting a word puzzle game, they'll have you start matching these words and you start taking this off that starts revealing this woman. And before it, it ever reveals anything, you'll stop and ask the question. This one AI girl says, uh, are you married? And he said, no. And she said, well, I think you are. But then, but then it comes, the question comes at the bottom of the screen. Do you still go with her or do you go home? And they're trying to get you to take this. And I'm guessing if you, if you go ahead and, and get that app and probably have to pay for it, then, then it's, it's going to be full-blown porn. I'm guessing. I don't know. I don't fool with it. But I'm telling you, our kids... Our kids with their, their phones playing these games, they're being inundated with this message. So, remember, I'm telling you here, AI porn is a problem. And it's getting ready to be a big problem. And because it's AI, doesn't mean it's any less porn. Folks, I'm telling you, Satan is as crafty as he can be. And he's coming, and he's coming hard after... He's not after me. I'm an old man. I'm setting my ways. L listen, he, he, he's not going to entice me with these girls, but he will these young boys. And even though some of the problems may be different, but when we look at this, because this is not just a message about baptism, this is a message about salvation. Because we're looking at what saved Noah. Well, in Noah, what saved him was his faith in God. And like in Noah's day, the ark will save us. The ark is symbolic of our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the reason I'm saying it doesn't matter if it's mass casualties or what kind of evil is coming upon this world and, 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 and uh, trying to knock the house, the, the door down to our houses and churches and our people. I'm telling you, we can resist these things and, and the Lord is there. The same thing that saved Noah and his family the ark is the ark is will save us being symbolic of Jesus Christ and that shed blood on the cross the cross will save us all who have been washed in the blood will will be saved and, and then Peter is, is is letting these folks know 
that you are more than conquerors. I understand that, that Nero is coming after us. I understand that Christians are being persecuted. There's even some, uh, uh, some people that say, and, I, and I've read some of these uh, his, historic books, that, and I've said this before, that they would use these Christians as human lamps to light up the streets at night. So all of these things are happening, and who knows when they're be about to start happening right here in the United States of America. And we need to be grounded and rooted, not in a, an ideal of Christianity, but we need to be grounded and rooted in the truth that we find written in the Word of God. And just as much as the blessings of God is true, so is the sufferings. We are going to have to get ourselves where we will learn how to suffer with Christ because He said the world hated Him. It's going to hate you also. We've not had to experience that, but we will if we live long enough. And, and Peter is, is giving us some encouragement here. So we see what saved Noah. So what, when we talk about the waters, what do they represent? Of course, we've already answered that. They represent God's punishment of sin, which leads to death. In the letter to Romans, Paul tells us in Romans 6, 4, that we are therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too can, can live a new life. Jesus undertook the punishment for sin and death. Judgment fell upon Christ just as the flood waters fell upon the ark. Peter is making this ever so clear to us today. And if anything, if we will just accept the Word of God, it will strengthen our faith in who Christ is. Jesus died because of our sin even though He was sinless. And He rose to life again, just as those being Delilah today, just how she will be baptized and raised again out of the water. Remember, what you see today is not the event, but it's pointing to the event. And in the first service, I tried to say Delilah's last name. And... and well, I'll just go ahead and fess up. It wasn't recorded, so I don't have to. So I said, it's some kind of crazy name. <laughs> and so then I went to Jaime during Sunday school. I said, hey, you say your last name. He told me, I said, oh, Lord, I knew it was crazy. So the American version is Lajaran. Lajaran? Is that it? So these girls are telling me no. All I know is this hillbilly boy just has trouble with that Venezuelan last name. So, uh, so we'll just leave it as Delilah is getting baptized today. And Lord help us on the rest of it. And by the way, what I've started doing over the last few years, prior to that, I would sit down with the person being baptized, made sure they understood. I stopped doing that when it's a child. Not my job. It's Heidi and Jaime's job. And if they don't know how to explain it to her, then Heidi and Heidi and the pastor. Heidi and Jaime and the pastor need to sit down and have a Bible study lesson. But they do. And I don't. And I didn't. And they've done a wonderful job with their two kids. And if you know them and their kids, you would, you would strongly agree. So we see what saved Noah... What the waters represent is sin which leads to death. So the question, maybe the final question, is how do they cleanse? When we look back at the flood, it cleansed the earth of sin, but it didn't cleanse the people. 
It killed the people. Destroyed them. The waters of baptism do, do not cleanse. They represent our destruction. There is a cleansing process represented from baptism, but it doesn't come from the water. It comes from putting our faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and that He and He alone is the only way we can be saved. There isn't a part two. There isn't a dual covenant. There isn't Christ plus this or Christ plus that. It's Christ plus nothing equals salvation. That is the gospel message in a nutshell. It's what Peter has given us today. And with the destruction and all the turmoil and the persecution and the suffering, I guess maybe Peter decided he needed to give them a reminder of the gospel. All throughout the Bible, not just the book of Peter, that only through the sacrifice of spilt blood can a person be cleansed from sin. And that's, 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 that's of huge importance. It is. But it's just as important. Well, it's, at the time it would at least appear to be just as important that if we're in the middle of some type of disaster, mass casualty, the, everything that you can think of is going on, it seems like the devil is winning every battle. We need to remember that we've been bought with a price. We've been bought by blood being shed on Calvary's hill. We're not just mere people walking this earth. Actually, if you look into some of the Scriptures and the martyrs in the book of Hebrew, chapter 11, because that's where I was going to go today, and you get near the end of the chapter, and it talks about these people that, that had the faith, but they didn't, they didn't see the results of their faith. And the Bible goes on to say, and the world was not even worthy of these people. That's who Peter is reminding his audience and the audience today who we are. Folks, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life as far as we're just going to have these trials, these tribulations, these sufferings. But we need to remember if we are hid in Christ, if we are not venturing off into left field somewhere, or, or, we're just, or, or we're not just living with an ideal of Christ, He will take us through. And if we're lucky, we'll draw our last breath in this foreign land that we're in that we've become way too comfortable in, and He'll take us on home. Now, as for me, I want to stay here because there's some more people I want to talk to. But this world has nothing to offer me. I, I don't know of anything this world has that it could offer that I, that I have any desire for. As Christians, you and I need to be focused on that. And, and, and Delilah here today... It's an outward expression of an inward commitment. Now, I know you're homeschooled, but many times being around our families when we're at our worst. So, that means you're going to be a better daughter, a better student. You're, I mean, everything's going to be better. We're going to strive to do better. That's, that's, that's what Christ would ask us to do. And, and when called to stand for the truth 
of who God is, you'll do that too. There's a lot taking place here today for us to enjoy. But the event happened however many months, years ago. It happened in her life. And Christy, come on. We're going to close this out. And while she's coming, for those that say that... Stand up, Delilah. How old are you? Ten. All right, all right, you can sit down. That's enough. <laughs> For those that say th these kids are too young, folks, there's a lot of there's a lot of statistics right now that says if we've not got them by the time they're 12 and 13, we're not going to get them. So I don't want to hear too young. She probably understands things a lot better than you may think. I know. I I don't want to question her on something. Listen, first time she came in the sanctuary, not the first time, but a few times, and, and I said, well, if you can't hear it, come up to the front. And she jumped right in this front seat, and I looked down, and she had her Bible and a notebook and pen, and I thought, oh my goodness, she's writing down what I'm saying. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm, I'm very honored to be able to get to do this day, and I invite you, and, and, and then I'm going to say this, and I'm going to sit down. The difference we're going to have in the, in the, the uh, baptism today, the worship team will, I, I'll address the congregation just for a second, I'm not preaching a sermon, just for a second. Then we'll go change. The worship team will be up here. Then after we go into the water and come out, instead of waiting for us to come back here, all you guys go on to the fellowship hall, and, and uh, Jaime and, and Delilah and myself will meet you over there once we get, once we get changed. So you're not going to stay here and wait on us. Everybody's going to the fellowship hall. When I get over there, I'll make mention.